Ray, you're the Alan Turing Professor of Complex Physical Systems. What are complex physical systems and perhaps you could give us an example of one? So many of these terms that we use to describe things we see in nature are really based on our own human understanding of things. So for us, a complex physical system is one in which there are properties that emerge in a sort of surprising or complex way from the underlying constituents. So a good example would be a suspension of swimming bacteria. So if you want to understand the properties of such a suspension, especially when it's very concentrated, uh, you need to understand everything from the smallest scales of how those bacteria swim with their flagella and how they interact with the fluid and how they interact with each other all the way up to the scales in which you may do an experiment. So that's in contrast to something like a question of uh, how high can a mountain be, where you might think that uh, fundamentally the constituents of matter are described by quantum mechanics, uh, but I don't need to know all that quantum mechanical detail. I can just accept that materials and rocks have a certain strength to them, and from that I can build a theory. So it's this interaction between many different length scales that essentially defines complex systems. And can you tell us about the area you work in and that your research group work in? So these days we're focused very much on problems in both evolutionary and developmental biology, and in a sense the intersection of the two. So we're particularly interested in the origins of multicellularity in biological systems, basically the question of how it was and why it was the simplest uh, life forms that first appeared on Earth evolved from single cell organisms akin to bacteria to larger organisms with more cells, but also more cell types, breaking up life's processes into different uh, uh, components of cells. And uh, in the service of that question, we've been very interested in certain kinds of developmental processes in simple organisms that involve the folding of tissues and geometric rearrangements of structures that are very similar to things that we see in higher organisms, like, like us, uh, but which are much easier to study in those simpler contexts. So it's a combination of experiments on those biological systems and mathematical theory. Now, you're the Alan Turing Professor of Complex Physical Systems. Most people know of Turing's work as a code breaker and as a computer scientist. So how does his work relate to your area of research? So in 1952, Alan Turing wrote surely one of the most important papers in all of science in the last century. Uh, it was entitled The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis, and it was a startling mathematical discussion of uh, the fact that he discovered that whereas uh, molecular diffusion, which is this process that spreads out chemicals in water, if you put a drop of ink in water, you know that it spreads out. But that diffusion, which we rightly associate with homogenizing concentrations, when it interacts with, when that process interacts with chemicals reacting with each other by chemical kinetics, uh, you can actually get patterns. So the classic example is what you see on this seashell. This is a, a textile cone from my childhood seashell collection. Uh, what you see here is a pattern of black and white, which is not perfectly regular, but there's clearly a characteristic wavelength or length scale to this structure. And the idea that this could arise purely from physical means, a combination of diffusion and chemistry, uh, was totally new. When uh, Turing proposed it, we now understand it to underlie a tremendous amount of phenomena in biology and in physics. Uh, and it was that that was Alan's key contribution to uh, mathematical biology. Ray, what are you currently working on that you're most excited about? So one of the projects that's uh, very interesting to us at the moment has to do with what we call the extracellular matrix of uh, simple multicellular organisms. So in many parts of us uh, and in many other kinds of uh, organisms on Earth, one has tissues composed of cells, but also something called the extracellular matrix, which is a proteinaceous structure exported from the cells. And it gives structural and physiological support to the, to the cells. And there's a very interesting question, which I've kind of phrased as, uh, how do cells make structures external to themselves in a reliable way, in a robust developmental way? And we're using a green alga called Volvox, which is a spherical multicellular organism with about a thousand cells on its surface embedded in this transparent extracellular matrix. It's a workhorse organism for these kinds of studies. It's mostly extracellular matrix. And because it's mostly transparent and of a convenient size, we can image where every single cell is. We can understand the development of this extracellular structure in 
exquisite detail and try to understand some of the mathematical principles governing the distribution of uh, material that's exported from the cells. And so we're on the cusp, I think, of a real breakthrough in understanding this as a paradigm for the general problem of how cells make external structures. So a second uh, problem that we're interested in, and it's very timely this year, uh, has to do with cicadas, which are these um, insects, uh, primarily in the US, which uh, live underground for many years, typically prime number years, like 13 or 17, and then emerge in great numbers. And this year happens to be an emergence of both a 13-year brood and a 17-year brood right next to each other. Now, it's been known through some work in applied mathematics, actually, a number of years ago by the mathematician Joe Keller, that these prime numbers arise uh, essentially as an evolutionary strategy to avoid predation. Basically, you get out of sync with any possible predator because you can't divide a prime by anything else. Uh, but there's a secondary question, which we've worked on recently, having to do with how, in a given year, do all the organisms actually emerge at the same time? It happens as the temperatures warm up in the spring, but if you do a bit of calculating of the distribution of underground temperatures, you discover there's a lot of noise in it, and it would be very hard for any individual organism to precisely say, yes, this was the moment when it reached, I don't know, 18 degrees. But we've discovered by studying a particular mathematical model that when there is communication, even short-range communication among these organisms making this decision, they can much more accurately come to a group consensus and emerge in great numbers. And we're hoping there'll be some experiments to test this soon. We're here at the Department of Applied Maths and Theoretical Physics at the University of Cambridge. What's it like working here? Well, it's a perfect research environment. Uh, I've been here almost 18 years, and it's a combination of a, a very broad department in terms of the subjects represented, everything from string theory and cosmology to what I do to um, image processing and uh, artificial intelligence for healthcare. It's a, an incredibly broad department, and that comes with a, an ethos that if it's interesting, just do it. Uh, there's no sense of uh, what, is, what is appropriate or not. It's basically just uh, the world is your oyster. Uh, and at the same time, there's an incredible collection of expertise in all those areas and a lot of interdisciplinary back and forth about interesting problems that cut across disciplinary boundaries. So that's another really good aspect. And maybe the third is the incredible facilities we have. Uh, as I said, we have an experimental lab, which is an unusual thing for a math department, but it's, it's an incredibly good lab with a lot of infrastructure and a lot of support from within the university and the department.